What is up, wrestling fans, and welcome to the latest episode of the Paul Heyman Smackdown podcast here on the Smart Cat Moment channel. I'm your host, as always, Callum Wiggins, and joining me back on this journey back in time is Roy Deflex. Hi, Callum. We are knee deep in 2003. How are you feeling? Um, and honestly, not as high hopes as I had going into 2002 at this point. It's uh, it's been yeah. okay. There have been bits and pieces, but there are also signs which are pointing me on the negative side of things. Which is mainly revolving around Dormery. An we're in the home stretch, and uh, yeah, I don't know if we're gonna go out with a bang or a whimper. I don't know if you're getting in the same vibe as me, but I'm getting the vibe watching some of these that Heyman's losing a bit of power now. Yeah, it's very much like watching Raw from when he first took over to by the end of his run, his most recent run, where you're just like, okay, this is just the same show as it always is. Yeah, he always this... starts out strong and then loses every drop of power he has. Yeah, you get a sense now that he's really starting to piss off Vince and Stephanie. <laughs> but, uh... I, don't, I don't know why. Like Nothing that we've seen so far has been egregiously offensive. No, I guess, obviously, he has a different mindset to Vince. Vince, as we've talked about, favors the big guys, which is why we're getting pushes of people like Bill DeMott at the moment and the A-Train being repackaged. But... The thing that's always discussed about, especially when I, lit, when I watched the uh, Heyman documentary, is just the sense that Heyman is very abrasive and is very, like, my not so much my way or the highway, but he's very focused on his ideas and the way that he sees things, which don't always mesh very well with other people. And if they don't mesh, then I don't think he's one who's open for compromise as much. And I, I would say the same thing is probably true of both Stephanie and Vince as well. Yeah, which is a shame because if they could find a way to work together, they would be able to create something special. They just never bring it to themselves to work together. Well, we're going to be talking about uh, episode 29 here, which I've entitled The Honeymoon from Hell, for very obvious reasons. But before uh, we talk about that, um, I invite everyone to drop a like and leave a comment below on the uh, YouTube video if you're watching it through that means. If you're listening to us via one of the podcast platforms, then drop us a rating or a review or anything else that you can do on those feeds. On the YouTube channel as well, there's a playlist going all the way back to the very first episode of the Paul Heyman's Fat Down podcast, where you can just check out every single episode in perpetuity. That's a, that's a difficult word to say. That is like, a word. Yeah, yeah you know what? It's not word. It's not used a lot. It's a good on you. Yeah. And there's a link in the description below to the this episode of SmackDown on the WWE Network if you haven't checked it out yet, if you'd like to check it out in advance, or if you want to check it out afterwards based on our descriptions of things that happen on the show. But first, let's talk about some news. So, an interesting little tidbit, The uh, Rock made his, I guess, A return to WWE at a house show in Anaheim, California. That's good. Yeah, he appeared on the um, January 4th, so I guess uh, that was their Wrestle Kingdom. That was a Wrestle Kingdom, Wrestle Kingdom <laughs> moment. Yeah. Uh, he saved Booker T from a beatdown by Jericho and Christian, performed a spin so Yeah. Been... Basically, they're testing the waters. Well, he's been tested as a babyface there. But there were signs that he was getting booed and Gene chided as a sellout on the mm. on the house show. So, and as time goes on, we are seeing that Rock will almost certainly be brought back in a heel capacity, which obviously he ends up being. Thank God that we're getting the Rock on this show. Yeah, we will get him uh, very much in a couple of uh, weeks' time. But there was also uh, Vincent Mann met with Bret Hart. At, oh, no. and, um, in, uh, this is actually a bit far back, but it's the time that the news was reported in The Observer. So this was on uh, the 18th of December, at Vince's condo in Boca Raton. Or Boca, is that Boca Raton? Is that how you say it? Or Boca Raton? Yeah, Boca Raton. All oh, right, okay. Uh, apparently this was their first face-to-face conversation since the uh, infamous conversation they had the day before Owen Hart's funeral. So he it, it doesn't reveal too much about what was actually setting it, but at least it's showing that there might be some foring of the relationship. I mean, this is post Bret Hart having a stroke. Wasn't like Vince the first one to call him, or one of the first? I believe I believe Vince did. Uh, yeah, get in contact with him afterwards. So maybe... I I feel like Vince, when it comes down to it, when his guys especially had those moments, he becomes a human for five seconds and just starts to reach out. And be good to people? Yeah, p- potentially, yeah. I can imagine that there was some discussion, but I imagine at least some of that discussion was business-related. Yeah. Um, other backstage news, there's a lot. Of, there was apparently a lot of heat backstage on Matt Hardy. 
Um, the idea essentially was the idea, I think this stretches back to something we mentioned about a month or so ago, which was that Matt Hardy was upset about the fact that A Train was given the Mysterio injury angle and he wasn't, even though he'd, his gimmick had been getting over pretty well. And they decided, oh, we're just going to repackage Albert as the A Train and do that instead. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's fair. It's Matt Bloom was one of those guys who's never going to have a good run. Yeah. But um, yeah, so Matt Hardy being vocal about that essentially uh, resulted in a couple of the agents in particular, John Laurinaitis and uh, Fit Finlay, being quite negative towards him and trying to get his uh, push slowed down. It's kind of shitty, but, mm. you know, Matt, Matt's a guy who knew what he could bring to the table always. And sometimes in wrestling, people don't like that. Uh, Triple H was also being vocal backstage about something, which was uh, he didn't. In- he thought that both Tough Enough and Confidential were harming the the uh, company in general and harming the business because they were exposing the business too much, and it was hurting his ability to get over as an old school heel. That's hysterical. <laughs> let's dissect this for like. Let's just go. The guy who had to take the heat for the curtain call is now saying, kill this and kill that because we're exposing the business. I think that's rad. Yeah, I I guess so. I mean, to be fair, he was part of the curtain call, so... I know, but that's what I'm saying. Like, like the guy who did it and who's like, hey, let me go say goodbye to my friends in Madison Square Garden, is now like, hey, do you think we can kill this program on MTV because it's exposing the business and I can't be a heel? Yeah, I'm pretty sure um, that program was killed on MTV pretty soon afterwards anyway. I think uh, they're, they're currently doing a Tough Enough Season 3. I, I believe one, that was, right? Yeah, but I think that was the last one on MTV. I think the next one was... was the next one Smackdown? Into Smackdown, yeah. Yeah. So, and then there's another like pretty bizarre news story. I say mm-hmm. bizarre, I mean, it involves someone who we don't really talk too much about or don't really care too much about, which is Sean Stasiak. Oh, no. <laughs> no, it's nothing. It's nothing weird or like um like well, nothing like oh he attacks someone or something to that effect. It's so apparently uh, he cancelled a radio interview, um, claiming that he didn't want to get any heat because he was heading back to WWE soon. So that was that was the line that he gave um, <laughs> to this um to this um interview of somebody somebody called a uh, Jason Barrett of No Holds Barred Radio at the time. So I guess it, they brought him in wanting to do a shoot interview with him and he declined saying that he was uh, going to go back to WWE soon. Uh, but then he did an interview later with uh, Chris Yandek, I believe, of the same web- of the same uh, radio station, where he claimed that there was an imposter, Sean Stasiak, going around who was posing with <laughs> him, giving interviews to other radio stations, like other shoot interviews, but it wasn't actually the real Sean Stasiak. Well, God, I can make so many... Like, which one's from Planet Stasiak, and how do you know? <laughs> yeah, how many, maybe it was another inhabitant of Planet Stasiak that's come to interfere with his works. That's right. I mean, wow, that, that is bizarre, because who would want to be Sean Stasiak? You know, like, <laughs> that, that, that's, first of all, like... He's a he very a successful chiropractor now, so I don't want to be, <laughs> don't I, be too offensive. I, I'm sure he's doing great, but I'm saying in 2003, in the context of the time, who is like, you know what? I'm going to be this guy. Yeah. It's I, very I, strange. I don't know if this riddle will ever be found, but I just saw it in the Observer and thought it was funny, so I thought I'd bring it up here. So that's Very funny. So that's uh, the news sorted out. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Raw, shall we? Right. Uh, so Raw episode from the, oh, which one was it? I believe it is the uh, January the 6th edition of Raw. Scored a 3.6 on the ratings. So it's the first one back. Obviously, we didn't talk about Raw last week because they did their clip show. Uh, SmackDown, in comparison, scored a 3.9. So SmackDown wins again, but... Only by a small amount, definitely a lot smaller than it was uh, the previous time these guys went head to head. So it's gone from a 0.6 gap to a 0.3. So it's an improvement. Yeah. Um, what was Raw doing? Um, based Something on what I saw, Gunner. yeah, based on what I um, saw through the like reviews that I read to like buff up for this or whatever, it's just the idea. It didn't really seem like a very interesting episode. 
So there was a Triple H and Scott Steiner did a pose down. <sighs> I still maintain that, like, this goofy, I want to be 1985 Ric Flair shit, as bad as it is, is one of the last times Triple H was genuinely fun as a villain. Yeah, so he did uh, did the pose down. A uh, Triple H won because the judges were bribed. Oh uh, yeah, I remember that. And they beat they beat up Scott Steiner too. After yeah, they that. started doing a press up competition, and when uh, Steiner Steiner was obviously prone, someone kicked him in the gut. They started crowding him. So there's like six guys crowding around Scott Steiner. Scott Steiner beats them all up, throws them around, stares down Triple H at the end of it. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so that's what your main event angle was at that point in time. Um, you know what's weird is they get uh, this is so trivial, but they get both the video packages, the music videos for the pay per views that mm-hmm. they fight at, and this is so not an intense feud to be given the songs that they're given. And I just think you had Benoit and Angle right there, and yet you're like, yeah, we need to give this Triple H feud a hard rock video package. Didn't work. That. Like you, you have like you have that for the um. Obviously, you have Angle and Benoit doing that. You also have the Royal Rumble, right? You could do a video package for if you wanted to. Spoiler: uh, They don't do a video package for the Royal Rumble. Oh, uh, wait till we get to February. I'm going to have a little tangent about how you had the perfect song for a particular angle, and then you gave it to Scott Steiner and Triple H. Yeah, so other than that, um, there was a title change. William Regal and Lance Storm defeated Booker T and Goldust for the World Tag Team Championship. After um, after Chief Morley took out the original referee and counted the pin for the heels. Boy, I just could not care any less about this current tag team division. This sounds awful. Mm. Uh, other thing that's happening in the tag team division, which was Dudley Boys lost a four-on-two handicap match to three-minute warning Rico and Batista. I thought we beat up Rico because Rico was the problem. I thought we got rid of Rico. What the hell? No, Rico's uh, back working with 3 Minute Warning again, so... Continuity, man, I tell you. Mm. Uh, Shawn Michaels and Chris Jericho had another, like, exchange in the ring. Uh, Randy Orton interrupted, claiming that his shoulder is nearly healed. Obviously, he's been on the shelf for a while. Um, Randy Orton, Shawn Michaels, and Chris Jericho would go on to interact with one another in these very same ways for, like, another eight years? Yeah. At least, (laughs) like... Pretty incredible. So Michael's decked Randy Orton during this. Chris Jericho and Christian came out to attack, or they obviously attacked Michaels. Kane and RVD made the save. This led to a main event tag team match, which Kane and RVD defeated Jericho and Christian. Yeah, um, that sounds right. I'm guessing Christian ate the pinfall. I imagine so. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that was what Raw was up to. No- nothing. There was other, obviously, little bits and pieces, but I didn't think anything else was particularly memorable or interesting enough to really talk about. Which means we can move on to the January 9th, 2003 edition of SmackDown from the Tuscan Convention Center in Tuscan, Arizona. Where was what, Tucson. what hotel Tucson. did Tucson. Tucson. Uh, Tucson. Tucson. Yeah, today's Tucson. Tucson, yes. Fuck yeah. me. You're you guys fine. have weird names. You guys have weird You're names. You're fine. <laughs> uh, but where did the honeymoon take place, Cal? Uh, the honeymoon took place in Hawaii, I believe. Oh, right. Why, why, that's why I supposedly believe that that was what they said that they were doing last week. I, I'm sure it was uh, filmed in a nice on location in Stanford. Yes, I imagine hey. so. Uh, the opening video package is focusing on the feud between Brock Lesnar and Big Show, including Lesnar decimating Matt Hardy last week in last week's main event. Do you like these? Yeah, I think it's a good recap. Do you prefer these to what they do now, where they have the guy come into the ring and they go, Roll the footage, and then you get a long video package. I would like, like, let's just start it off with a video package. If you've never seen wrestling before, you're at least caught up to what you're watching tonight, and you can jump in from there. I think this is a very good strategy. Yeah, I definitely prefer a three-minute video package to a 20 to 30-minute promo that doesn't really set anything up. Or if it does set anything up, it's already the match that's already been announced as the main event earlier on. But I digress. Raw right now sucks. So let's move yes. on to uh, uh, opening match. Oh, no, another thing that's great about these sort of things, you can actually start off with a match rather than a promo segment. So it's right, because big... you've already gotten the promo segment out of the way. It's Big Show versus Rikishi. So Big Show's on right. the cover of 
That's a lot of ass. I just, I gotta get, you know, you gotta just let it out. That's a lot of ass. Yeah. So Big Show is on, yeah, Big Show's on the cover of Raw magazine, and Pete's referring to him as stepping out of the shadow of Andre the Giant. Big Show's on the cover of Raw magazine. Mm. Did they not have SmackDown magazine yet? No, I I think they just called the overall WWE magazine Raw magazine because that's what they had beforehand when SmackDown was just another show. I do know they do get a SmackDown magazine. Yeah, as, well, as far as I can tell, they don't have it yet, considering a SmackDown guy is on the Raw magazine, so uh, I imagine they don't have it yet. And then the stepping out of the shadow of Andre, did Big that shadow. curse the Big Show? Um, Well, you would say that maybe was the curse happening in WCW then when they actually said that he was the son of Andre the Giant. I almost feel like, at least in the hokey world of wrestling, that's more okay than going... Well, his, he's a, just a guy named Paul, and uh, he's seven foot tall, and he's like Andre, and he's more athletic than Andre, but he's not Andre. I, I really do feel like that hurt him a lot. So, obviously, match between two behemoths. I should say with a caveat at this point that Big Show at this point is suffering with a back injury. A pretty significant back injury. So then he suffered for, like, the rest of our journey. For, well, pretty much until he retires in 2006 really. uh, Big Show is having obviously physical issues um, they have this match with Rikishi so Rikishi hits the butt kick tries to lift Show up Show fights out hits a scoop slam on Rikishi does it pretty effortlessly it's one of the things that obviously Big Show is 500 pounds and he's 7 foot tall so you should expect these things but how easily he lifts up guys like Rikishi is pretty ast- astonishing really yeah but it it emphasizes that he is a big man. Uh, there's a long abdominal stretch segment which ends when Sho uses the ropes and the referee catches him doing it. Uh, Rikishi does his uh, famous flip bump off a Big Show clothesline. Big Show then hits the choke slam and pins, pins him. That, that is totally fair. It was about three minutes long, this match. They absolutely squashed Rikishi. That's totally fair, and I'll tell you why. Big Show's big, and he's a former WWE champion at this point. He should run right through anybody. And running right through a guy like Rikishi symbolizes, like, I don't give a shit how fat you are and how big you think you are. I'm the big show, and you're going down, and I love it. Fair enough. It does kind of make... I know Rikishi's not doing anything super special at the moment, but it does... You could have think... They could have picked... Makes John Cena look bad. Yeah, it makes John Cena look bad. It makes anyone that's feuded with Rikishi and had to lose to him in the last few weeks look pretty bad. Don't worry, by the end of this year, Cedar will be uh, giving the big show the FU, and he'll be, he'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Hangman promises that they will teach Brock Lesnar a lesson before the end of the night. And we got a break, and then we're straight into another match. Oh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention him at the top of this. There are nine matches on this show. In a two nine hour matches on a wrestling show? In a two-hour show. Less That's than two exciting. hours, really, if, like, obviously, you take out uh, advertisements and stuff. So there's got a lot of wrestling to talk about on this one. Uh, fortunately, Although not simultaneously, not enough. Yeah, and not yeah, a lot of it is not very long, obviously, because of that. <laughs> uh, but it's John Cena versus Chavo Guerrero. So, so Cena's rapping is getting really, really good. Yes, he's getting better here. Have I explained my? I don't want to use the word disdain. Are you aware that I don't much care for Chavo Guerrero? A- yes. After a yeah, you, point. we've spoken about that a lot. Yeah. yeah so like. This is where, like, I, I just... All right, you're Eddie's sidekick right now. You're not doing it for me. I know what happens to him after the unfortunate passing. Chavo doesn't do it for me. At, from this point on, Chavo doesn't do it for me. Uh, so Cena's... Um, the, the, I always pick out on the lines that he says, which could be problematic if they were used in the 2020 context. Uh, the one that stood out to me is that you hate me because I'm white. That's reverse discrimination. I hate you for two words, illegal immigration. <laughs> I, you know, it's it's awful, and it's four more awful. years, bro. Four more years. <laughs> it's awful considering everything that is going on today. But when you think about like John Cena, of all, the most wholesome man, mm. John Cena, just getting away with saying these really, really intense lines makes you really think. Yeah, I guess like. It's easy to escape these sort. Oh, I'd say easy to, but he's done quite the one eighty in escaping this gimmick, and and he can always go like, "That was a character." 
Mm. You have seen my body of work since then. Uh, so Eddie looks pretty intense walking towards the ring. He has, has a nice like stare down with these guys as well. So this is obviously building towards a potential tag team title match, which we will talk about on next week's show. Yay. I, I wonder if B squared and John Cena win. Um, so heads is by Charvo, followed by clothes under the floor. This is the one thing I have to say about this match. I know obviously you're talking about like not liking Charvo and stuff like that, and I think Charvo's fine. There's definitely nothing super special, but it's good to watch. But the most amazing thing watching this match is that Charvo Guerrero getting the heat or getting offense in on John Cena is just I know this is a very different John Cena to to what how John Cena is perceived today, but right now it's just like these guys are on equal footing. Yeah, isn't that always fun? That's the most fun thing about looking back. When you see guys who become untouchable bumping around for people who will stay in the exact same spots, it's so fun. Uh, so B-Squared knocks Chavo off the top rope. Eddie springs into an attack on B-Squared. Uh, Cena and B-Squared uh, beat up Eddie on the floor. Eddie actually now Cena with a punch, but the referee doesn't call a DQ. Like right in front of the referee, he just punches Cena square in the face, and uh, they didn't get a DQ. Chava hits a plunger on Cena. Uh, Eddie then suplexes B squared on the ramp. Uh, referees then separate them, force them to the back. Uh, at this point, uh, Chavo hits a suplex. He goes for a, a flurry of pins. Then he attempts a sunset flip. Cena grabs the rope, sits down, pins Chavo. So yeah, uh, it was a match. I like it. Uh... Yeah. Cena hasn't figured out his footwear yet. No. That's funny. Uh, He's still wearing boots, but he is like in, in the gym shorts now. John Cena, John Cena gear. I like it. Uh, we see a recap video of last week's wedding. Uh, they then cut to the honeymoon suite where Dormery opens up uh, the door wearing like red lingerie and a, a sheer black robe. So he's basically wearing nothing. That's pretty much the, the way of saying it. Uh, Dawn says they've been in Hawaii for a week and she's exhausted because Al Wilson is a total animal and she says there'll be more to come tonight as they do a public broadcast of their honeymoon why? Because why didn't you just pre-tape the week and then yeah I, I mean I guess it's just they wanted to do like a live thing because they're all about doing things live and doing things publicly so and that's kind of the gimmick they're getting across, is that Dawn is making Al do all this stuff publicly, because she just wants the attention. Yeah. Uh, again, she's not a bitch, but she's a bitch. You know, like, like she's, she seems attention-hungry, but she doesn't seem like a bad person. Like, I guess, yeah, it doesn't look like she's abusing Al or anything. Yeah, like it's just, she just wants to be... Do you know who Anna Nicole Smith is? Yes, I know who Anna Nicole Smith is. Okay, I I don't know. <laughs> I know she was a I know she was a um well a Playboy model and like she's married to a ninety year old man. Yeah, feels like she wants to be at the cosmet. Yeah, to be fair, that's a gimmick that could work. If you wanted to do that. Uh, Billy Kim versus Matt Hardy, non-title match, obviously because Matt Hardy at this point is not considered a cruiserweight. Yeah, uh, yeah, not yet, but it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. Well, yeah, that's why I was kind of like, interested when I saw this match coming up and just saying, like, oh, they obviously don't feud over the Cruiserweight title soon. And there's a long, the long build up to the Cruiserweight title with the fact that, spoiler alert, obviously, for the weeks going ahead, is that Hardy has to lose weight to reach the Cruiserweight limit. And that's, that's why I thought it was weird that they were having this match straight away. But and at the moment, it's nothing title related. Um, Matt has a uh, heated toilet seat and he likes pulp in his orange juice. Uh, both. Uh, okay, I like the heated toilet seat. I, I don't like pulp in the orange juice. Not a fan. Nah. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really see the point of having something that you basically have to just swallow through other than the yeah, actual liquid. Yeah, I, I've never I've never understood, like, what do you need that for? Uh, so head scissors and drop kick by Kidman. Uh, more trips Kidman on the outside that allows Matt to get the upper hand. Um, he uh, smoothly reverses a sleep hold into a sidewalk slam. Uh, there's a step up bulldog by Kidman after blocking a side effect attempt. Uh, hits an Inzaguri that hits Matt right in the face. Uh, he hits his shooting star press from the top rope to oh yeah that was the cool that was the cool segment. I saw shooting star press and just assumed it would be the regular one, but this is the one where he climbs up to the top rope. He hits it to both Hardy and Moore on the outside, which is a ridiculously dangerous and cool move. Good for good for him. He deserves Billy Kidman deserves some kind of flowers. You know, like he. 
he he wrestled, he did a thing, and I feel like not enough people talk about it. You know what he did on this move? He collided heads with Shannon Moore. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Listen, Billy Kidman deserves respect. Is all I'm saying. Yeah, he has. Yeah, he deserves it for athleticism and a lot of ability in the ring. He also has the ugliest shooting star press in wrestling history, but we'll digress. But he put other, it on other, the map. Yeah, other than Brock Lesnar's one at WrestleMania 19, which we will be discussing on the Patreon at some point in a couple of months' time. I completely blame Kurt Angle. He should have rolled into it. Um, so Kidman avoids a uh, leg drop, hits the knee cane bomb. Uh, more friends Kidman get into the top rope. Hardy throws Kidman off. Uh, Kidman blocks a twist of fate, sends Hardy into more on the apron, does an O'Connor roll, gets the pin. So for, for like a five-minute match, this was pretty good. Yeah. Um, Hardy tells Moore to get into the ring. Moore thinks he's going to be punished, but Hardy says it was just an honest mistake. And he'd rather Moore tries and fails than never try at all. He forgives Moore, raises his hand, hugs Moore, even though he, like, it looked like he was teasing, attacking him, but he just gives him a hug and they get going. I like this, Matt. And, you know, he's kind of reviving it now, and I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, Brock takes a walk backstage. Uh, they show footage of Edge in Seattle doing promotion work for WrestleMania 19, which has a cruel irony about it because Edge doesn't Edge perform at WrestleMania 19. Edge will not be at WrestleMania <laughs> Not anywhere near it. Edge, Edge, Edge unfortunately... Edge will be at 20, for that matter. No, yeah, exactly. He's, he's soon is out for over a year soon. Unfortunately, we'll get to see his final bits of work before his uh, neck injury. It's wild to me how much time off this man... If you... Take the accumulated time off that Edge has taken for injuries, even subtracting the obvious nine years. It's a lot of time. Mm. It's at least three years of his career. Yeah, but it goes to show what these, um, I guess... Don't get these fucking DLC matches, yeah, like, jeez. I mean, to be fair, people like uh, Bubba Bubba can still work and stuff like that, and Jeff is still... Jeff, somehow, is still working at the level that Jeff Hardy is still working at. Well, uh, Jeff... I feel like one day, I hope not, but it seems like he, he has to just, like, break one day. Just because, damn, how do you put yourself through that? Uh, so Josh Matthews interviews Tori Wilson about the wedding last week, which Tori refers to as disgusting and tasteless. Uh, Tori, Tori's... be happy for your father. Christ, <laughs> just let the man have a smile or two. Uh, Tori says Dawn embarrassed her father by making him get married in the nude. Even though he seemed completely up for it, because it affected his dancing well. <laughs> Tori, I need you to have an honest conversation with your dad. Yeah. And now they're showing a live tape from their honeymoon, which Tori considers revolting. Uh, yeah. To be fair, I can understand that, because he wants well, to see I'll the understand that part, because you constantly. don't need to see that. Yeah. Uh, Tori says Dawn will get what's coming to her. Uh, Josh says this, we confirmed that at the Royal Rumble, it will be Tori versus Dawn in the first stepdaughter versus stepmother match. And then he does it as says it's a comparison to Cinderella. Because wicked stepmother. And yeah. that's a, that that's about as far as the planning for this angle ever was, I bet you. Yeah. Uh Tori says that she'll beat up her evil stepmother at the rumble, and then if she ever gets hold of a glass slipper, she'll put it somewhere that it won't fit. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she basically just looks at the camera and says, Well, I plan on putting that glass slipper, it won't fit. And it's just <laughs> just well, like I, Well then. We go, we'll yeah. talk about this at the Royal Rumble. Obviously, if you're if you're a Patreon subscriber or if you want to become a Patreon subscriber at the ten dollars tier or above for all the dark cast, you'll hear our extra review of that. I turn on Tori so badly, and that after what, what that match, you'll you'll you when yeah. you listen to it, you'll hear it because she, ugh, she, people give Kelly Kelly a hard time. I mean, fuck me, it's like that's yeah, it. we'll uh, get there. Hall of Famer Tori Wilson. Uh, let's talk. Uh, <laughs> Jamie Noble versus Tajiri. That, the furthest thing from Tori Wilson's working ability. Yeah, this match is great. Like, every cruise like match is just so much fun. So much fun. Even though, again, this is like five minutes long, it's still really, really good. Uh, so, Tajiri goes for a tarantula early, but Noble throws him on the apron. He blocks a kick, slides between his legs, gets Tajiri on his shoulders, drops him across the barricade. In like, in like three seconds, he does that. It's just, uh, these guys are really quick. They're such, they're so modern. Yeah, but again, this none of these matches, like one of these matches in particular, looks doesn't look completely out of place in like would would fit right into a AEW or WWE show or NXT show nowadays. Uh, you know, it's, it's weird to me that these guys are the guys who never got their due, and yet if you look, the Billy Kidmans and the Jamie Nobles, 
probably defined more of modern culture than any other wrestler. I mean, you were talking about former Ring of Honor champion, Jamie Noble. Yeah, but Ring of Honor, you know, they, they knew. <laughs> yeah. Um, so to do it one point, bridges out a pin. Noble gets another pin attempt uh, for like a double clothesline spot. Uh, drop toe hold in the corner by Tajiri for him, followed by a bridge insert German suplex for two. Uh, handspring elbow. Noble with a brilliant roll through into the trailer hitch, targeting the ankle of Tajiri because Tajiri has just come back from an ankle injury. So it makes sense. That is a great name for a submission hold for a man who lives in a trailer. Um, Noble assaults the leg of Tajiri, but Tajiri counters a strike attempt into the tarantula. Uh, Noble avoids the buzzsaw kick as Jerry reverses a tiger bomb into a catapult. Noble lands on the second turnbuckle. Jerry catches Noble with a kick as he dives. Then he hits the buzzsaw kick and gets the victory. Beautiful. Yeah, very, very good match. Uh, Cat Angle gives uh, Team Angle a pep talk before they go for a walk. Um, now, oh, I'm so excited. walk down the corridor anyway? Like, yeah. These people really enjoyed walking down corridors. Yeah, they did that a lot in the um, Attitude Era and early Ruthless Aggression Era. I don't know why people don't walk now, though. I don't know. Because they're always just in backstage segments. Just there's true. always a camera, it's always stationary, and they're always just fine people talking to each other. Well, there you go. Shock TV. Um, I'm so excited about this, Rob. It's the first Nathan Jones promo. Yeah, ain't it? Oh, I don't boy. know how much we're going to see of him, because we're not doing... We're, like, we're stopping on the February 27th we're episode of SmackDown. Yeah, mean? we... we well, yeah, we'll talk about him at WrestleMania, definitely, but I don't know how much of SmackDown we'll get of him. Because, obviously, there is a gap between Heyman's last show as head writer and WrestleMania. So, we're not covering that. We're not going to cover all those episodes of SmackDown. Because we've strict brief, this is Paul Heyman's SmackDown. As soon yeah. as he's not the head writer, we don't, we don't watch anymore. We don't care. SmackDown's gone. <laughs> Never coming back. Um, but, yeah, we see, so we see the first Nathan Judge part where he, he asks, what would you do with 10 years of free time? And then his arm reaches for a cell door in an Australian prison. So uh, answer me this. And I, I think I know the answer, but I want you to verify this. Do you think nowadays they would build up a superstar based on the fact that they are an armed robber who spent 10 years in an Australian correctional facility? It would, de- it would really have to be a great redemption story. They wouldn't do it like this. They wouldn't do it like, hey, I'm a badass. I went to jail. Fuck with the, you know, it's like, they wouldn't do that. Yeah, because because at the end of the day, like WWE does have a number of convicted people on their roster. I mean, MVP spent about uh, a decade in jail. Right, for, and they tried to, to use that for uh, like a redemption story, but it didn't work as smoothly. Yeah, same with Booker T. So yeah, we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, obviously we'll talk about that WrestleMania 19. You don't you worry about that, but. Um, <laughs> But yeah, they are using this as an indication that Nathan Jones is a, a violent criminal and he's going to come to WWE and be super violent. Not like in this time, it's not the worst idea, but it doesn't work out. No, it does not. But we'll discuss that. Hope Maybe we'll discuss that later on, depending on how much of Nathan Jones we get to see on, uh, on SmackDown. But for now, we have Edge versus Charlie Huss. Um, so before the match gets started, Chris Benoit comes out to even the odds for Edge because Angle and Sean Benjamin are in Charlie Huss's corner. Uh, there's some good mat wrestling early with Edge fighting off Huss with a hip toss and drop toe hold. He hits the face plant for a two count. Uh, Huss starts to take advantage or starts taking over, hits a nice northern lights throw. Um, Edge escapes a double arm stretch into a backdrop on Huss. Huss hits a uh, German suplex, obviously Angle coaching from ringside. Um, Edge kicks a diving huss into the gut, followed by belly to belly throw. Um, then it starts uh, breaking down really because other people get involved. So Benoit pulls Angle off the apron. Benjamin super kicks Benoit. Edge spears Benjamin off the apron, hits another one on Huss, but Angle pulls Edge off at the last second. The referee doesn't see it. Uh, Angle hits Edge with a crutch on the ropes again. The referee doesn't see it. He's not really doing a very good job here. <laughs> yeah, I uh, hate the I hate blind referees. Then Haas hits a T-bone suplex and wins, which I thought was hilarious because of the fact that that was Shelton Benjamin's finisher for a while. That's going to be Shelton's move, yeah. Yeah, but Haas gets the first uh, win, singles win of his uh, SmackDown career over Edge, of all people, so that's a good a good rub for him. Putting him over strong, man. Yeah, it gives uh, Team Angle some credibility, even though they cheated to win. Uh, Team Angle attacks Edge in the post-match, but then Wild chases them away. 
Uh, Benoit then cut to promo doing like a TikTok motion. So uh, this is where Karrion Cross got his idea from. Uh, so there's only so much time until he makes angle tap and becomes a WWE champion at Royal Rumble. Uh, Benoit then challenges Benjamin to a match right now. Uh, and they accept because straight after the break, we've got Chris Benoit versus Sean Benjamin. Wrestling followed by wrestling followed by wrestling on this show. And I like it. And then it's going to be followed by something that's not wrestling. No. Third <laughs> thing from it. Well, actually, I say third string from it. It's sports entertainment. We go from wrestling to sports entertainment. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of transitions of Matt wrestling early from Benoit and Benjamin. Uh, with, Ang- with Benoit almost locking Benjamin in the crossface a couple of times. Uh, Benoit hops with some hard chops, knocks Benjamin down. But as he's rolling out of the ring, he trips Benoit, drags him outside, slams him against the ring apron and the barricade. I thought that was really cool because like, he goes down off the chop and he seems like he's just going to roll out and just take a bit of time. But he just trips him as he's about to roll straight to the outside. I thought that was really good. I like it a lot. Um, there's no surprise here. We talk about this every week. Benoit, after June of 07, shitty human being, right? But mm. like, Benoit... As a wrestler, at any point, oh boy, please hook it to my vent. Benjamin does quite a lot here in terms of just making himself look good. He leaps while delivering a back suplex, which is, I don't know if, uh, hopefully that's not dangerous, but it looks fucking cool, so I'm okay with it. Uh, a butterfly suplex to Benoit, a power slam, Northern Light suplex. Benoit keeps kicking out of all of these repeated pin attempts. Uh, he pretty much leaps his... Uh, body on the ropes, onto the ropes on a pin attempt at one point, spotted by the referee. Like, he just tries to do a cover where he's trying to get his foot on the ropes, but he essentially gets his entire body on there instead. Uh, he then does the free, the uh, Bret Hart bump out of the corner, so even he's infected by it, even though he's only been on the show for a couple of weeks. And then uh, free German suplexes, diving headbutt, locks him in the cross face. Uh, Angle comes down to ringside, he distracts the referee while Benjamin taps out. He then hits Benoit in the gut with a crutch for the DQ. So Benoit wins by DQ. Um, Benoit then lost Angle in the cross face. He taps out immediately. Haas breaks it up. Edge comes down. Big Brawl breaks out. Uh, Benoit with uh, Germans to both Team Angle members. But then Angle beats the hell out of him with a crutch. Uh, Team Angle holds Benoit up. Angle hits him with a belt to the face. Uh, he applies the ankle lock. Team Angle make an unconscious Chris Benoit tap out. Like he's out of it. So they just like tap his hands on the mat instead. Which is a great move. Angle looks so intense in this role. Like, Ang- Angle we talk, we've is talked a about great it before. For a wrestler. Yeah, we've spoken about it before. Angle, as an intense, like, okay, this guy's an absolute killer in the ring, is the best cut angle. Yeah. So, yep, yeah, there was a good match and a very good, a very effective post match. Makes uh, Angle look even stronger as a heel. Um, and what, what more can you ask? I uh, certainly wasn't, wouldn't have been asking for this, which is Al Wilson staring into a steamy mirror in a hotel bathroom, uh, looking exhausted as Dormarie talks to him from the shower. Uh, she emerges and asks if he's uh, ready again. Al, is, you can tell, is slightly hesitant, but he... <laughs> I'm sorry. But she's, like, slowly draining this man of his life. Mm. Legitimately. Yeah. And it's just fucking awful. Yeah, so Al's hesitant. He hops back in the shower anyway because it's dawn. And yeah, they do some more stuff that we don't get to see. Thank Uh, God. hmm? Thank God. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. Uh, (laughs) Bill DeMott versus Shannon Moore. He only goes up from here. Uh, (laughs) uh, So so Matt Hardy on commentary claims that this was Moore's idea to have this match and says that the tough challenges will make him a better MFer. Uh, I just, I just, the MF is just funny to me. Just really you think, <laughs> how hard do you think he had to think about that? I'm sure he had the MF ready to go. Yeah. Uh, Demot starts with headlocks, of course. It's swing neck breaker, more headlocks. Uh, Taz and commentary are struggling to do the V1 side. Which is probably yeah. the most entertaining part of this entire match. Uh, Demot applies something that uh, Taz refers to as a bottle cap to more, which is essentially like a guillotine. But I think she's using one of Moore's arms to assist him. Uh, they say, Taz describes it as like a figure four he- leg lock to the head. I think more people should do that. Uh, Moore tries his best to make this more exciting when he hits a springboard leg lariat to knock uh, Demott down, but then he's decked by a clothesline on his next dive. Demott nearly falls over while delivering it. Demott then hits a cut wrench power bomb and wins. I like the gut wrench power bomb. Gut wrench power bomb's a good move. Good the move. Rest of it, the rest of it sucks. Yeah. 
It's I hate talking about this because it's like I wish we could skip it because it's nothing. It goes nowhere. Uh, Post match, Hardy applauds and hugs more. Then he hits him with a twister fight. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Because tough man, he you needs to know. Bastard. He needs to learn. You cheeky bastard. Uh, so we see another Undertaker hype package. This time focusing on Ministry Undertaker. These bastards. <laughs> these, these these evil sons of bitches getting little young me all hype for a match that ain't happening, bro. Like uh, he's just gonna come back on the bike. Spoiler alert! I don't care. Like yeah. he's just, but- just gonna come back on the bike. Come on. Well, this was interesting because when I saw they were doing like so, they'd done the original Dead Man beforehand. Now they're doing Ministry. This is when I start. If I was somebody watching at the time, I would assume he's coming back with another character. Oh, like he's evolving again. Ah. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Because I kind of just get the sense of okay, so they're doing his first gimmick, his second gimmick. I assume next week they'll do his third gimmick, which is the obviously American badass Dead Man Inc. Undertaker, and then okay, so. They're going to give him something else when he comes back. But no, as you say, he's just on the bike again. Yeah, lame. Uh, we do a tail of the tape for Brock versus A-Train. They started doing tail of the tapes quite a bit now. Yeah. Uh, somebody was watching Mixed Martial Arts and was like, that's cool. We should do that. Uh, with one of A-Train's accolades being that he's a former San Diego Charger. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. But why? Like. Well, but, I mean, to be fair, Jim Ross was on a kick of hiring people that had worked well, But why is that an accolade at this moment right now? Well, because A-Train only has one other accolade, which is a former Intercontinental Champion. It's a great accolade. I mean, it's a great accolade, but then when you... I guess they wanted to put on the tail of the tape, like... Because they have, like, three for Brock, which is uh, WWE Champion, King of the Ring, and NCAA uh, Champion. And then on A-Train's side, if they only have Intercontinental Champion, it looks a little bit weird. Because it's just like one against three, so I guess they kind of had to think, okay, we got to give him something else. Wasn't he a hardcore champ? No, he wasn't. Really? Huh. No, he was never hardcore champion, never European champion, which you assume is the only other two titles that he could have potentially won. That's that's unfortunate. I believe that is that. As far as I'm aware, does he ever win any other title? Uh, I don't think he ever gets a tag title. No. What well, Tom so... Punk never won the tag titles. Tons of Funk never wins it. He never won it with Scotty, and he doesn't win it with Test. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, let's move on to Eddie Guerrero versus B Squared. Um, so Cena's going to do another rap, but the Guerreros tack him on the stage before they can do it. Um, Eddie hits a helo to the back of Cena. Oh, not Cena, uh, to B Squared. Uh, military press slam by B Squared. Then he hits a leaping leg drop for two. Uh, Cena is wearing a headband around his neck. Because, uh... I guess... It's a. He's trying. Like, you gotta know, he's throwing everything at the wall. And honestly, I'm sure at that point, it probably was fashionable somewhere. Uh, Eddie flips all the way over for a backdrop, then B squared nails his springboard clothesline. Uh, B squared then hits a falcon arrow. Nobody kicks out of that, yeah. Uh, Eddie did manage to. Uh, ah, Eddie, there then, it is. Eddie then manages to hit a tilt the world backbreaker on a much bigger guy. So that's impressive. Yeah, uh, and Bobby Kenton's impressive. Yeah, he's he's got a decent amount of athleticism. Uh, Chavo hits Cena with a title belt when Cena tries to use the chain. Uh, Eddie hits a backdrop, then hits the frog splash, and gets the win. It's a match. Uh, and Ed, the right man won. The right man won both matches. You tell me at any point in time John Cena wins, Eddie Guerrero wins, I believe you. Uh, so Brock is training backstage by lifting a pair of propane tanks. Dang, dang it, Brock. You don't disrespect the propane. Uh, Dawn Marie says that she's uh, feeling frisky as she crawls over to Al Wilson on the bed, who seems to be asleep or dead. Da- I- <laughs> <laughs> Al Wilson needed some propane tanks in his body. Yeah. To deal with Dawn Marie, poor this man was literally fucked to death. <laughs> like this poor human. Was just, I mean, I could think of worse ways to go. <laughs> I could too, but the, you literally drained the man of his life force dry. The only blessing here is that this is somewhat over and that they didn't do a Tori, I'm pregnant storyline to follow this. Okay, so commentary run down the SmackDown side of the Royal Rumble card. Won't, won't delve into it too deeply here because we'll do an actual Royal Rumble breakdown next week's show. 
Uh, Big Show and Heyman talk backstage to A Train into their locker room. A Train says that they can have whatever left of Lesnar after he's done with him. Plans on cementing his reputation tonight by inflicting a career ending injury to Lesnar tonight, as he did to Rey Mysterio earlier. Um, yeah. Does it know? Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, look at these. You look at these two men, and they're going to be on Team Lesnar within literally like eight. What if eight months? What? When did it? When did they join Brock Lesnar? Uh, the build up towards Survivor. Uh, actually, it's probably um, build up towards SummerSlam. Uh, I loved this pairing. I am a sucker for big guy A and big guy B, and we slap them together, and now we got a tag team. I think that these two should have made a run for the belts. Yeah, I think that it probably could have worked, definitely. Uh, we see another Nathan Jones promo of him sitting in a uh, cell holding his head, talking about how he likes the way he thinks, but others might not. And then he screams into the camera. Ugh. God, this is... It's weird, because not only is this offensive in the sense of, like, okay, so you're praising a criminal. But then it's like, again, you do nothing with it. He's a former WWE World Champion here, guess. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we'll, we'll, again, we'll, we'll see if we get to talk about him a little bit more in detail. I'm so, I so want to see him have just one match. You know, just, I hope that we get to see... Another and, member of Team Lesnar, by the way. Mm. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Brock Lesnar versus the H, right? Two members of Team Lesnar, eventually. Um, well, why do you think they didn't just run with that and they didn't do it past the Rare Series? Uh, because of two guys that were on Team Lesnar, in particular. <laughs> uh, yeah, fair. I assume partly due to the fact that Nathan Jones, a month afterwards, decided to stay in Australia and never come back. What a weird guy. What a weird fella. Um, and then they obviously had to repackage uh, Matt Morgan as a stutterer. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, he's legitimately near seven feet. He's jacked to the gills. But let's... Everybody needs a flaw, Callum. Uh, Brock Lesnar versus... Yeah, so Brock Lesnar versus A-Train. Um, Brock ducks a uh, bicycle kick, but he hits a derailleur for two almost immediately. Uh, A-Train hotshots Lesnar, but then uh, misses a clothesline and runs to a power slam. Uh, free belly to belly flows, throws by Lesnar. Um, hits the F5, and there's the wind's comfortable. About, yeah. about three minutes, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, not offensive. Yeah, I guess that, that they're building up both Lesnar and Show by both having them beat up big guys fairly convincingly on bookending this show. So yeah, I, I guess that's the story they're telling. Yeah, because the story can't be your WWE Championship match between two wrestlers. No, well, to be fair, that, that fitted into the top of the hours. So they gave it a decent. Yeah, okay, but, like, I, I never, like, you know how when you see, it's like, oh, Punk and Brian are the title picture, but we're gonna, the main story is Cena and Big Show. It very much feels like that. Like, okay, we get it. They're gonna actually wrestle for the title, and that's not your thing, so the bigger story is somewhere else. Um, Brock calls out Sean Heyman, saying that he wants to go to school if they're gonna teach him a lesson. Uh, Sean Heyman walk the corridor until they reach a pair of signs saying arena to the left and parking to the right. Heyman says Brock can't beat the sh uh, big show. And then they walk to the parking lot with Heyman saying gotcha as they walked away because they baited Lesnar into thinking that they were going to go attack him and they're not going to do that instead. That's so, fair. So there's something that they cut out after this, which was, and, and they do show this footage a couple of months uh, later, but for a completely different reason. But what they cut out from this, edited out the show, is that Lesnar hits another F5 on A Train. Now, that's very, yeah, that's a very, yeah, there's a very good reason why they do it. It's the fact that Brock Lesnar drops A Train essentially vertically on the top <laughs> of his head. <laughs> I, knowing that A Train obviously doesn't get any seriously hurt by this, it's obviously worth just going back and watching because if you watch the clip and I saw it on YouTube because I wanted to look it out, it's um. You see Taz and Michael Cole on commentary when it lands, and Taz, his hands go right up into the air to his face, then his face goes down because he thinks that he just saw someone die in the ring. It's oh, that bad. It's that uh, bad. I'm going to watch it right now. <laughs> yeah, you watch it quickly because I can't, I can't begin to describe how he doesn't get seriously injured from this because... Oh he's, no, Taz looks like he's just seen a ghost. Yeah, because he's like, A-Train is 300 plus pounds, like, probably around about 350, and all his body weight comes right down on his neck. 
from about oh, five, six feet in the air. Fuck. How does he not break his neck? I know. And now th- this is becoming a, sl- a bit of an issue now because Lesnar has already broken Hulk or Holly's neck and he nearly broke the A-Train's neck here. Is Lesnar too reckless to be the top guy in the company? Maybe he was too reckless to wrestle on a regular basis. Yeah. I think it's something that goes understated with Lesnar. It's the fact that because Lesnar is such a freak of nature and Lesnar, his push was so huge and he's such a... And he was a big deal. I'm not saying that he shouldn't have been pushed by any stretch of the imagination. But these signs are clearly somebody who either doesn't know his own strength or is still green. Yeah, I I think I'm going to go with the former. He doesn't know his own strength because he knows enough. So, so not over yet, though, which is what we uh, cut quickly to a distressed dormitory and paramedics uh, with Dawn saying that Al is not breathing. She's basically screaming. She's hysterical. Um, the paramedics use a defibrillator on Al. Then they say they've got a, bu- a pulse. Because That's shitty. Because, for a very good reason, is that you can't actually show someone die on TV. <laughs> so <laughs> they had to show, show Al. Don't go back there. Mm. Well, basically, they show that Al supposedly survived this. We'll find out next week how it actually... They basically do it as like a cliffhanger. It's like, oh my god, did Al Wilson survive this? Did he survive nope. being fucked to death by Dawn Marie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like, they carry Al away on a stretch. I'm surprised that Dawn Marie didn't get, like, you know, killer in bed shirts from this. Like, I'm surprised that Vince McMahon didn't immediately try to hook himself up with Dawn Marie mm. after the same. So yeah, that's uh that was that was that after a night of nine wrestling matches in a row, that's how they end. Oh, that, that, hold on, let's let's just have some fun here. Can you imagine the promos that Vince McMahon could cut about how he won't die while fucking Don Marie because he is just that virile and he is just that much of a man and that much of a genetic jacket. Like this could have been. A little bit of fun off the back of this. But now we just get Al Wilson dies. Yeah. Well, um, well, unfortunately, we had to go into the situation where Vince, when he saw that idea, thought it was okay, but then thought it was an even better idea to have Stable as his mistress after Sable left the company due to sexual assault uh, claims against Vince and that. So, yeah. And you yeah. know what? Uh, and Brock decides, I'd rather fuck Sable than work for you, pal. Amazing, yeah. amazing just connection of stuff here. I hated this Don Marie Wilson thing. I'm glad it's over. It's not quite over. It's it's almost over. It's it's Yeah, it's almost it's, over. We'll have next week to talk about as well. But um but yeah, in terms of the show, I mean there was a lot of just short but solid wrestling matches. I want more of this today. Yeah, so you have to appreciate a wrestling heavy show. Um, even though it had all the Dormarie Owls and bullshit, it was that was kept fairly contained in fairly short segments. Because how uh, many characters have we seen tonight? Oh, uh, count up how many wrestlers, how many how many wrestlers. So they were all singles matches. So and there were nine matches. So that's eighteen, eighteen wrestlers tonight. And that's these... not counting, you know, Kurt Angle, Benoit. Oh, well, Benoit wrestled, but Kurt Angle's there. You got uh, Matt Hardy. Wrestling. Um, on commentary and stuff like that. You got all these extra characters being utilized. Imagine if they started doing like five minute matches nowadays, how many more people could you use? I know that sometimes we want to go balls to the wall and everybody has a good 20 minute match, but you don't need to. I think it's the issue is the fact that you just Raw goes three hours. So like, they feel like they have to fill most because they fill most of it with these 10 to 15 minute matches because that means they don't have to actually think about what they have to do in, in between those. That's that's my yeah. only assumption. Also, I mean, I, oh yeah, right. I was, as I say, I can't complain too much about a show which had absolutely no Stephanie McMahon on it. Yeah, I like shows without McMahon's. That's that's been one very good thing about wrestling today. I'll say that. Well, that's going to change soon, so don't uh, hold your breath too much for that. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> okay. So, but yeah, that was the episode back then. Any any closing thoughts about this one? Um, I liked it. I could have done without the honeymoon stuff, but we're we're so close to the end. Uh, I'm sad that we're nearing the end of our journey because I feel like there's certain elements of SmackDown that are just heating up, 
and I wish we could talk more about it. Like, you know, just get into like the rise of Cena and stuff that is even more pertinent to our time as fans. True, but we're sticking to the brief. Stick into the brief. No, oh, get... and unless people pay us enough on uh, Patreon, it's, they say like just make us go back and watch any more of that stuff. If you want to do that, then go definitely go right ahead and do that. Obviously, the pick your poisons here, fifty dollars. You can get us to watch any episode of SmackDown that you want, any episode of Raw that you want, any pay per view review, anything like that. You can just get us to talk bullshit if you want to for a couple of hours. That's totally fine. Uh, obviously, if you're at ten dollars here. If you subscribe to Darkcast, then you'll be able to see the Royal Rumble review, which we've got coming up soon. And also go back and check out every single other uh, review that we've done of every pay-per-view show from 2002. Well, at least from the time we started onwards, so from Vengeance 2002 onwards. Uh, Otherwise, you can obviously support us financially. There's the Redbubble, there's the Public, the merchandise shops. You can pick up some Smart Cat Moment merchandise. Uh, The membership on YouTube as well, the applause button. If you want to hit those things, everything would be greatly appreciated. Uh, there's the website of course if you can't help us monetarily then just check out the website you can check out the articles on there see all the stuff that's going out weekly any one-off pieces as well just read everything follow the fantasy league all that great stuff uh, follow us on facebook follow us on twitter at smart count moment uh, join the mega maniacs which is our facebook group uh, facebook.com slash group slash the mega maniacs um, there is uh, Fanboys Anonymous, which is Tony's geek culture side of the um, side of his empire, where he talks about the movies and uh, comic books, TV shows, video games. We'll soon be doing a series on there, which is the Review to a Kill, which is where me, Rob and Tony will be going back and reviewing, in, in, in a sense, all of the Bond movies up until, um, well, no time when No Time to Die comes out. I can so, also, I, I believe safely say that um we're gonna be tony and i at least will be watching a disney animated film which what it's a patreon sponsored thing i won't say which one it is but we will be watching a disney animated film for the patreon well they don't have many of those no they don't it's got a slim picking uh rob you want to throw out your other stuff yeah i'm on fightful.com all the time uh, I believe it is it is the ninth, so we'll, we're covering Genesis from Impact Wrestling this weekend. Hard to Kill from Impact Wrestling next weekend with Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers. And we're also covering everything else throughout the week, whether it's Raw, SmackDown, NXT, NXT UK, 205 Live. Somebody does that. I don't. Uh, MLW. It's all there. It's all on Fightful.com. Subscribe. Subscribe to Fightful. We have a Twitch account, twitch.tv slash Fightful Gaming. Subscribe to Fightful Select. Just check us out everywhere, and we thank you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Wigmeister14. And yeah, we'll see you next week for the Go Home Show to the Royal Rumble. Uh, but until then, this has been another Smart Out moment, and we are being counted out. <laughs>